Hello and welcome to today's lesson on data handling, which forms part of the measurements and errors topic in AQA A-level physics. Now in today's lesson, we're going to try to understand how we graph data in A-level physics. So if we're successful and we learn in today's lesson, we can understand the rules of graphing with error bars. We can understand the properties of straight line graphs. We can determine the line that best fit for graphs and calculate the uncertainties from graphs, which falls into the following part of the AQA A-level physics specification 3.1.2, limitation of physical measurements. And also one of the skills that you require for AQA A-level physics 6.4, graphs. So graphing skills can be assessed in both written papers for a, the A-level grade and by the teachers during the assessment of the practical endorsement. Now you need to recognise that the type of graph that you draw should be based on an understanding of the data that you are using and the intended analysis of that data. So this lesson we're going to look at the rules of drawing graphs in physics. So we're going to look at the axes labels, the scale of the axis, the line of best fit and the error bars. Now the axes of a graph should be labelled with the quantity being measured and the units and they, these should be separated with the forward slash mark as shown in the diagrams on the screen. Now this happens as the slash acts as the dividing sign. So for example in the first axis 40 seconds becomes 40 when considering that unit slash. This happens because we can only plot numbers and not real world values on graph grids. So you do not use the familiar brackets when you're representing units on a graph. Now, data points should be marked with the cross. Now, both the cross and the plus marks are acceptable, but care should be taken that the data points can be seen against a grid as shown in these particular examples. Now, error bars should also be drawn with data points and the rules for these error bars will be considered later in the lesson. Now, when plotting the data, you should attempt to spread the data points on a graph as far as possible without resorting to scales that are difficult to deal with. So when doing this, what have you got to consider? The minimum and maximum values of each variable, the size of the graph paper that you have, whether 0, 0 should be included as a data point, whether you're going to be attempting to calculate the, the equation of the line and so therefore need the y-intercept, how to draw the axes without making difficult scale markings, so multiples of 3 or 7 or 11 will be very difficult to draw later, and that the plot should cover at least half of the grid supplied for the graph. So a line of best fit should be drawn where appropriate on your graph. However, you should be considering the following when you are deciding to draw your line of best fit. Okay, does the data likely have an underlying equation that's following a physical law, for example, and will help decide if the graph should be straight or curved? Um, are there any anomalous results and are there uncertainties in the measurements? Now, when we do this, it helps us to draw our line of best fit. Now, there's no definite way of determining where a line of best fit should be drawn. A good rule is, though, to make sure that there's many points on one side of the line as the other. Often the line should pass through or be very close to the majority of the plotted points. Now lines of best fit should be continuous and drawn with a thin pencil. It shouldn't obscure the points below and not add uncertainty to the measurement of the gradient by having a very thick line. Now these are all examples of lines of best fit. Now, just remember from GCSE, if the line of best fit is a straight line through the origin, we can say that the two variables are linked via direct proportion. So in this example, we can say the mass of the car and the, dis and the braking distance are directly proportional. How do we know that? Because the line of best fit is a straight line through the origin. Now, for A-level and extension activity, you've got to be able to prove direct proportion mathematically as well as just stating from a line of best fit, which we'll look at in the next lesson. Now again, this is another example of a line of best fit. Now just to consider something, when we have a line of best fit sloping downwards, we, we say it has a negative gradient. Now always remember a negative sign on a downwards gradient because it's a commonly tested skill on examinations. Now in addition to straight lines of best fit, you can also get curves of best fit in the data as well. So when finding the gradient of a line of best fit, you should show your working by drawing 
a triangle on the line. Now the hypotenuse of the triangle should be at least as half as big as the line of best fit. And you should always draw your gradient triangle on your graph and show you're working out. So when you're drawing the gradient triangle, draw a large gradient triangle. Make it clear, make it obvious, and the gradient triangle should incorporate at least 50% of the line of best fit. If you do not show your gradient triangle on your graph, then you will receive no marks for this particular skill. Now, the larger the gradient triangle, the more reliable the results, as more values are being considered. Now, the gradient triangle can only be used on a straight line section of a graph. So, how do you work out the gradient if the line is curved? Well, if the line of best fit is a curve, you must draw a tangent to the curve at the point where you want to measure the gradient. You then must find the gradient of the tangent by doing the change in y over the change in x of the tangent that you have given. But remember, this only allows you to find the gradient at one instantaneous point on the graph. It doesn't tell you the gradient of the entire, the entire graph, it just tells you the gradient at that instantaneous point. Now, so it's a measure of the instantaneous rate of change. Now, when you're measuring the gradient on a graph, to work it out from the gradient triangle that you've drawn, you work out your change in y on the triangle by doing the top value minus the bottom value. For, then the tr for the change in x, you do the high value of the x minus the low value of the x. That will then give us a value for change in y and for change in x. And then to work out the gradient, we say gradient is equal to the change in y divided by the change in x. Now, in any investigation, you've got to show you're working out for your gradient and the units of your gradient. Do not just write out the gradient. And we can use the gradient and the y-intercept of your line of best fit to determine the equation of the line. So you should be able to translate graphical data into the equation of a straight line when the line of best fit is straight. So we know y equals mx plus c, where y is the, is the x so the y-axis value, m is the gradient, and x is the x-axis value, while c is the y-intercept. So as a result, you can look at the data that you've been given to work out the equation of the line. So in this example, we've said the y-axis is y, the x-axis is x. We've worked out the gradient to be 2. We can see the um, y-intercept is 0. So therefore, the equation of the line is y equals mx plus c. So it's y equals 2x plus 0. And you can do this for any straight line graph of any equation. Now, this can be used for any experimental investigation even one you've not done yourself. So if you're given this data in an examination question, you can recognize that the y value is displacement. You can recognize that the x value is time. You can see that the y intercept is 0.2. You can work out the gradient is 4.85. So therefore, the equation of the line is equal to the displacement is equal to 4.85 multiplied by the time plus 0.2. Now, it's a common question on physics paper three that you'll be given a graph with an equation you did not know before the examination and then be asked to derive values for the equation from the graph given. Now, you can work out what the gradient represents on a graph by considering the equation. So, for example, we know an equation could be force equals spring constant times by extension. Now, you can then relate that to the to the um, equation of the line. So we know y equals mx plus c, but if it's a straight line through the origin, c will equal zero. So therefore the y-axis is equal to mx, or gradient times by the x-axis. We can identify in this particular graph that the force is on the y-axis, the extension is on the x-axis, so it tells us the gradient of our line, which we can calculate, is the spring constant. Another example will be this one. Force equals mass times by acceleration, so if we place force on the y and mass on the x, that tells us that y equals mx. So looking at the equation and equating it to the equation of a straight line, the gradient must be the acceleration. Another example, we could place time squared on the y-axis and, and mass on the x-axis. And if we know the physics equation is equal to time squared is equal to 4 pi squared over spring constant times by 
the mass. Well, therefore, by that logic, if y equals mx and time squared is equal to y, m is equal to x, so therefore our gradient is going to be 4 pi squared over the spring constant. And you can do it for any value you're given, and you can even do this to work out the y-intercept on your graph as well. So let's say, for example, our physics equation was thi equals rho theta plus epsilon, just some random variables. So what we can say is we know that the y-axis is equal to the gradient times the x-axis plus the y-intercept. So if we equate the physics equation to the equation of the line, we can see that thi is equal to the y-axis. We can see we can see rho is equal to the x-axis, so it tells us that the gradient is going to be theta and the y-intercept is going to be epsilon because we've equated the values with each other. Now, if you are given an equation, you rearrange it into a form where the y-axis term is by itself, and then we can use that to work out the gradient and to work out the y-intercept as well. Now, the term multiplied by the x-axis value will be the gradient, and the term that's added to the x axis term is the y-intercept. Now we can also show uncertainty in our experimental values by drawing error bars. Now error bars are a graphical representation of the variability of data and are used on graphs to indicate the error or the absolute uncertainty in a measurement. So it gives you a general idea of how precise the measurement is. So error bars are a graphical interpretation of the uncertainty you've calculated previously, the absolute uncertainty. So, error bars are a representation of this absolute uncertainty. So, error bars should be drawn on all experimental values you measure in A-level physics and drawn on both the x-axis and the y-axis, as shown in this particular diagram. Now, it links to the range of possible values that your measurement could actually be. So, the error bars show the highest possible value the data could be and the lowest possible value the data could be. And these values are calculated from the uncertainties you've worked out previously. So the error bars are an interpretation of the range of results you are sure the answer lies in. Now error bars can be used to determine if any results are anomalous in an investigation. Now previously, at GCSE, you had to estimate whether a result was anomalous. But at A-level, a result is anomalous if the line of best fit does not pass through any of the error bars of that value. So this result here at the bottom does not have any of the line of best fit go through its error bars. It is anomalous. Now we can also use error bars to determine the percentage uncertainty of the value, which is a different method to the method we looked at previously, because there are two methods to work work out the percentage uncertainty from absolute uncertainty. Method one we've looked at previously is the mathematical method, but method two is the graphical method. So you can actually work out the percentage uncertainty in your experiment by looking at the graph. So let's do a step-by-step -step guide to draw an error bars. So the first thing you do is plot the point on the graph. So let's imagine we've got a point of x equals one and y equals two. We plot the point on the graph, but we then draw in our error bar. Now, in this investigation, let's just say our absolute uncertainty for the y measurement is plus or minus 0.5. So, therefore, our value is actually, for the y value, 2 plus or minus 0.5. So, your error bar plots out this range from 2.5 to 1.5. Now, if you have a percentage uncertainty, you must convert it back to the absolute uncertainty to work out the error bar, which we've looked at in the previous lesson. Now, so therefore, the error bars plotting out the range, so the bottom line goes to 1.5, the top line goes to 2.5. Now, we'd also do the same for the x measurement. So let's just say it's 1 plus or minus 1, so we'll go from 2 to 0. So once again, our error bar is plotting out the range of possible values it can lie in. You repeat this process throughout and draw the error bars for all of the points. Now, just to clarify, if it's a percentage uncertainty, the error bars will change size for each point because when you're doing a percentage uncertainty it will give a different absolute dependent on each value. Now if a point and error bar do not get intersected by a line it's anomalous. Now the best line of best fit is the line of best fit you are used to drawing. This is down to experimental discretion. So this line of best fit, this best line of best fit was drawn at GCSE. It's the line of best fit that goes through the center of all the error bars. But there's a second line 
line of best fit you can also draw now you can also draw a worst line of best fit now that's a line of best fit that still goes through the error bars but barely does so so we'll either produce the maximum gradient the steepest line possible or the minimum gradient the shallowest line possible it doesn't make a difference which one you draw in your investigation because you can use either methodology to work out the worst line of best fit now the worst line of best fit is still a line of best fit that that goes through the error bars but it could be the steepest line of best fit possible or it could be the shallowest line of best fit possible so either line of best fit could be used as your worst line of best fit now the worst line of best fit is the most extreme gradient that could be produced from the experimental results after considering uncertainty and we can use this to now work out the percentage uncertainty of our value because the percentage uncertainty is a measure of the difference in possible gradients that could be drawn from the error bars so it gives a measurable variance due to the uncertainties found in the values so this is a method which we could use to combine uncertainties instead of the method we looked at previously Previously. So as we said before, there are two ways to work out percentage uncertainty in experiments. Either use mathematical rules or, like we're going to do now, use graphical rules. So imagine in this particular um, line of best fit, we've got our best line of best fit and we've got our two worst lines of best fit. Now the worst line of best fit could either be the steepest line of best fit that still goes through the error bars or it could be the worst line of best fit that still goes through the error bars. Now the percentage uncertainty uncertainty can be calculated by doing the difference in the best gradient and the worst gradient divided by the best gradient times by 100. Now this gives a result similar to the absolute uncertainty worked out mathematically. Now this in theory is a similar process to half in the range of the results to find the uncertainty and it's the same equation you've used earlier to work out the absolute uncertainty mathematically so the absolute uncertainty via this method is absolute uncertainty is equal to the difference between the best gradient and the worst gradient or the difference between the two worst gradients the steepest and the shallowest divided by two now it could also be the case we can do this for y intercepts as well as gradients so you can say that the absolute uncertainty could be the difference between the best and the worst y intercept or it could be the difference between the two worst y intercepts divided by two now we can use this to work out the percentage uncertainty by doing percentage uncertainty is equal to the difference in the best and worst y intercepts divided by the best y intercept times by a hundred so what have we learned in today's lesson we can represent uncertainty in a data point on a graph using error bars. We can determine the uncertainties in the gradient and the intercept of a straight line graph. And individual points on the graph may or may not have been associated with error bars. We can translate information between graphical, numerical and algebraic forms, plot two variables from experimental data, understand that y equals mx plus c represents a linear relationship. You can determine the slope and intercept of a linear graph. You can calculate the rate of change from a graph showing a linear relationship and we can draw and use the slope of a tangent to a curve as a measure of the rate of change. So if we've been successful and we've learned in today's lesson, we understand the rules of graphing with error bars, we can understand the properties of a straight line graph, we can determine a line of best fit for graphs and finally we can calculate uncertainties from graphs. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson looking at data handling in the measurements and errors topic. Thank you very much and have a lovely day.